Welcome to the Food Freedom Podcast, previously the Eating Disorder Therapist Podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Food Freedom Coach, and I'm really excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information, and soon to be invited guests to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you very much for listening today. So how are you doing? We're in the first week into lockdown where I live in the UK and it's been a week of challenges in many respects. I know for me personally, it's been quite an emotional roller coaster. There are five of us all living under one roof, all day, every day. We're trying to grapple with working from home and sorting out the technology and there have definitely been some highs and some lows. The children are having to self-motivate and adjust to managing their time and workload. And we're having very limited time, of course, outside the house. Queuing up to access Tesco's, not being able to get bread and pasta and the basics. It's all quite frustrating. And I'm now moving to work with my clients online. And this is an adjustment itself with some teething problems. And it is quite different from working to -to face-to-face. On the positive side, I feel the last week has been a week of getting in touch with lots more people online and in some ways, strangely, it has been a week of better connections and recognising the relationships that are priority and the people that I really care about. And I do feel really grateful for the people who are working long hours to keep our supermarkets and essential shops open and of course those frontline NHS staff doing the amazing work to support all the people affected by the virus. So it's been a whole kind of mixture of feelings really. And there's been a lot of change and there's still understandably a real underlying anxiety bubbling away through the nation's consciousness. So how's it impacting your relationship with food? Well, I know myself, I definitely have been snacking more and reaching for comfort foods. Now we do have a routine at home and I think it helps having the children because we tend to have regular meals and regular snacks that kind of suit the whole family. But it's still been a bit of an adjustment. And I found that I haven't really wanted to eat the meals and things in the same way that I normally would. I've been quite happy to snack a lot more and you know, I guess my eating hasn't probably been as healthy. But in light of all of this, I thought I would talk a bit more about emotional eating. Because I thought it's something that's incredibly relevant now, but it's also something that's relevant in normal day-to-day life. And it's something that can happen really when we're impacted by any kind of stress. So firstly, to talk a bit more in general about emotional eating. So what do I mean by this? So I think emotional eating involves turning to food when you're not really hungry. So it's a coping strategy often unconscious and short term and offers a bit of a fix for how you're feeling. So we know that food is very comforting and self-soothing. It can also offer a distraction from how you're feeling and it's quite effective at numbing emotions and you can kind of escape yourself for a bit. So short term, it works. You might feel happy, content, soothed and taken care of of course that feeling often doesn't last long. You often might feel quite guilty and anxious for eating afterwards. You know, if you've eaten a lot, you might feel uncomfortably full and you might berate yourself for turning to food. And of course, if you do this regularly, it might have an unhelpful impact on your body image and also your health. But it's important to say that not all emotional eating is unhelpful. For example, if you're having a piece of birthday cake to celebrate or joining in with the team biscuits at work, you know, sometimes we might choose to purely eat for emotional reasons rather than hunger, simply to share, join in and seek pleasure and connection with food. And that's really okay. However, it does become potentially problematic when food becomes your number one turn to for dealing with emotions. So I'm going to talk about three trigger emotions and how they can lead you to turn to food. So I'm just gonna talk about three here. So obviously I could talk much more extensively, but hopefully this will give you a bit of an insight. And I'm also gonna talk a bit about 
how you might deal with these emotions in a more helpful way rather than eating. So number one, frustration. So hands up if you felt frustrated this week. I know that I have, and I could quite unhelpfully rant for a good while about this. Um, I found that like technology hasn't been working after trying endless downloads of work email. My lovely children have been asking me a question every five minutes when getting stuck on their schoolwork. There's constant noise all the time. No time to catch a breath and seek some peace. And going to the supermarket, there's no bread or pasta or loo roll. And I found myself locking myself in the bathroom to do a client call at one point, as this was the only practical place with a bit of peace. So frustration is often born out of reality, not meeting our expectations. So I've had thoughts this week about how I think things should be going, but obviously the reality has been understandably somewhat different. And the trouble with our shoulds is that is they place us under a lot of pressure and then we have expectations. So there's a lot of room then for feeling not good enough or that we're failing. And this leads to a lot of internal negative self-talk going on about how things just should be different. Now, understandably, this week has been hard. There have been so many new things to deal with. And taking a step back, it was a complete fantasy to even expect that things would go smoothly. So in the past, frustration was often a trigger for me in binge eating. So I remember in student days when I had to write an essay, um, sometimes I would just place myself under so much pressure to get the work done. And I'd often have quite impractical goals that weren't really achievable. So for example, I'd be expecting myself to work for hours and hours on end in one go without any break. I'd be expecting myself to kind of produce something, you know, by the following morning when I hadn't really prepared. And, you know, I'm sure some of you will relate to this. And I'd feel so frustrated and I'd feel that I was failing. And I would often turn to food in sheer exasperation, looking for a heady escape or to seek a temporary oblivion from the frustration. And it kind of would fleetingly give me what I needed, which was time away from work. But of course, it wasn't a constructive way of having a break or it wasn't great for my self-esteem, though, because I often was feeling really bad afterwards. So frustration is an understandable and regular emotion experienced by humans. So what to do when you're feeling frustrated? So I know for me, it really helps if I do stop and pause and take a bit of time away for five minutes. Because in learning to manage your emotions better, you've got to be able to start to tune in and acknowledge how you're feeling. Because I think what often happens, particularly with emotional eating, we can often miss this step and go straight to the food without even thinking or feeling or anything. We just suddenly find our hands in the biscuit jar. So actually taking your t- yourself away from the situation for a moment and just like tuning in, like how am I feeling? What am I thinking? How am I feeling in my body? Just giving yourself a little pause. And if you're feeling really frustrated, try and reflect on your expectations. Are they realistic or not? And what is in your control in this situation and what isn't? Now, I know this week I've had to adjust my expectations around my work considerably. I've tried to take some control where I can and put strategies in place to problem solve. But some things I've just really had to accept and let go of. And I've had to just trust that it will all be okay and it will work its way out. So I have a routine in place so that I can feel that I can get some sense of accomplishment and enjoyment through the day. And this includes planning time out, gentle exercise and breaks. And I've also lowered my standards and expectations. And with this has come greater peace and acceptance. So if you're feeling frustrated, think about what you can do about this. What can you control? What can you not? How can you shift your expectations? Now, moving on to emotion two, which is grief. Now, grief is really an umbrella kind of term for a whole range of emotions. Um, So, but I'm going to talk a bit about grief more generally here. But uh, obviously, there's several emotions that are all linked to this. So, 
I just thought that this is particularly relevant right now because people everywhere are grieving loss with this coronavirus. It might be loss of loved ones. It might be loss of structure and routine. It might be loss of daily connections. It might be loss of a job. It might be loss of purpose. You might not be taking your exams and feel a loss of everything that you've worked so hard for. And with grief come many other emotions, upset, anger, denial, bargaining, low mood and finally acceptance. Grief is such a normal part of life and we experience many bereavements with every decision we make. I think about an old toxic boyfriend, someone I met in Australia in my 20s on a year abroad. It was a heady romance at the time, meeting in a beautiful place, being on holiday with no real commitments or pressures, a lot of socialising, doing the fun stuff away from all the pressures of daily life. It was a really romantic and special time and I idealised this person a great deal and the relationship that I thought it was. Now, although this person had his good points, he was funny, kind and charismatic. Sadly, he was also someone who lied and cheated and he was seeing someone else whilst in a relationship with me, something I didn't find out until later. And I remember at the time, it was really incredibly hard to reconcile the two sides of this person because part of me had fallen in love and genuinely liked him. And part of me also felt devastated and furious for the dishonesty and lies. I knew that I needed to walk away, but also massively grieved this relationship. And I massively grieved the fantasy of what I had thought it was. And this can be likened a bit as well to saying goodbye to disordered eating. Because yes, it does have its kind of good bits. It's yours alone, it helps you cope. And when it's going well, you feel in control and happy and a sense of achievement. But there are a lot of very big buts. There are huge costs to your health, your mental and physical well-being. There are huge costs to your friendships and your career or study. There are huge costs, full stop, to your life and well-being. But this doesn't stop you grieving the loss here. It is still a genuine and valid loss. So it is important that you allow yourself to deal with feelings of loss. It can all feel a bit overwhelming to deal with. And you can easily want to cope with turning to food in some way. So when I am tempted to turn to food, when I'm feeling some kind of grief or sadness or loss, I find journaling has helped me a lot because it's a way of like writing down and then processing and understanding my feelings. Another really helpful way for me to process grief and upset is talking to someone else who understands and accepts me. This has been really, really valuable because sometimes just going over things in your own head, you can just kind of get yourself um, tied up in knots and overthinking, whereas having somebody outside can help you kind of have a better perspective. So having said that, although I do like speaking to people, for me as well, having time to reflect on my thoughts and feelings is also beneficial. And I think when you're in recovery or when you're kind of grieving for something you can still if it particularly if it's an eating disorder you might experience kind of thoughts about wanting to do those old ed behaviors they can be very seductive um particularly in the moment it's very hard not to act on those um and in the same way like say with my toxic boyfriend um i would have moments of just really thinking oh but he was really nice you know perhaps I should get back with him but if you actually allow yourself to step back and reflect on the situation you can often see that you probably don't really want to act on those feelings because those feelings are kind of they're real and they're worth listening to in the moment but they're not necessarily ones that are going to act on that you should act on or they're going to be effective for you um okay Now, moving on to my final emotion, number three, which is boredom. So if you've been restricting your eating in any way, food preoccupation becomes dominant. You think about food all day long, dream about it, long for it, contemplate what you're going to eat, even if you're not eating an awful lot of it. And you can be hugely vulnerable to turning to food when bored. Food is also highly pleasurable to eat. 
eating offers us something to do with our time, it fills up space, it gives something to look forward to. And it's healthy that food is an enjoyable and happy part of life, and it's helpful that it brings us pleasure and fulfillment. However, if you're not you not feeling happy or fulfilled, and if you don't have a sense of purpose, maybe you haven't got many hobbies or things you enjoy, and if you don't have things that get you out of bed in the morning, if you have long gaps of time that you're struggling to fill, and if you're not actively self-caring for yourself in non-food ways, maybe by allowing yourself downtime and time to relax, then food can start to fill the gaps and offer some relief from the boredom. Now, personally, emotional eating due to boredom is not something I generally experience. I'm far more likely to eat when I'm upset, overwhelmed or frustrated if there's going to be any emotional eating going on. But it's something that some of my clients absolutely struggle with. So for example, my made up client Jane, she worked in an office, she was doing a job that she'd been in for years, she could basically do with her eyes closed and she was often clock watching and willing the hours to pass away. And she had a drawer full of all her favourite snacks and throughout the day she would open the drawer at regular intervals, more out of habit than anything else. She wouldn't normally feel that hungry as constant nibbling kept hunger at bay. However, food was a turn to for stimulation, pick me up, fleeting pleasure and something to do. It offered a focus and distraction from the boredom and repetitiveness of her job. So you might have found yourself feeling bored this week when having to adjust to home working, not having your colleagues around and not having a regular workload. You could be very vulnerable to reaching for food to distract or relieve the boredom. But if you recognise that you're bored, it's probably highlighting a need for some planning around your structure and routine. You might need to reflect on the activities that you're doing and how are you planning out your day? Are you being proactive? Are you balancing work with play? So you might need to think about getting some joy, excitement, stimulation from self-caring activities or a hobby or a new work challenge or something else. And we all have shoulds in daily life, which can be a bit monotonous and exhausting if the shoulds just dominate. So it's really important to have some wants in there too. And I know this is a bit more tricky now at the moment with working from home, but it's a chance to perhaps be a bit more creative. So in summary, we can all be vulnerable to emotional eating, especially in times of stress. Emotional eating fundamentally is a coping strategy to soothe, distract and numb from difficult emotions. But you can find more constructive and helpful ways of dealing with your feelings. Giving yourself time out to recognise how you feel. So you're stopping and pausing and listening to what your body's telling you. How are you really feeling deep down? Reaching out to others and connecting journaling, having self-reflection time, planning in activities that offer stimulation, self-soothing or self-care. These can all be really beneficial strategies. So have a ponder and reflect on these three emotional triggers and think about what's relevant for you. And you might have other emotions that are triggering for you too. This is not a full list by any means. If you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at Food Freedom Coach. And for regular tips and insights into overcoming disordered eating, do, do sign up for weekly articles on my blog page at foodfreedomcoach.co.uk. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon. Bye for now.